iron under there. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than three thousand bucks, Chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, shark! We've got a panel on our hands on the Fourth of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. No, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Welcome back to the Jaws Obsession, where it is a new year, and Happy New Year 2023 to everyone out there in the Jaws Obsession. We are back here once more to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. And with a New Year resolution, the New Year resolution here at the Jaws Obsession is to work just as hard this year to make sure everyone out there listening and everyone out in the world has access to the Book of Quint. That is the New Year's resolution. And we are going to fight and work hard to make that happen. So Happy New Year, everybody. This is episode 51, Jaws Subtext. What is subtext? And is one of the reasons why Jaws is the greatest movie of all time, uh, what keeps us watching it over and over again, what keeps us coming back and revisiting the movie, is the use of subtext by director Steven Spielberg one of those reasons? I do believe so, and we're going to get to that today on episode 51, Jaws Subtext. But we have a packed episode. Once, Once again, we have emails and book reviews to read to get to there. So last week I went on a uh, video talk show for the first time in a long while, and that aired on YouTube on Friday of last week, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, play a segment from that show. That's something we can talk about. And then at the end of this episode, we are going to hold a Book of Quint giveaway, a giveaway drawing. That's right, three books. I have three books here, and they're ready to go out to you, the listeners. Because that's what we're going to do. 2023 is going to be the year of the Book of Quint. And we are going to send these books out to three listeners that participate in the Book of Quint giveaway at the end of this episode. So please stay tuned. Thank you for your time and returning. And thank you for being back. Let's not waste any time here. Let's start right in with the emails. The emails are coming in here from Book of Quint readers and uh, the backers from the campaign or people that have been uh, able to buy the Book of Quint. Right now, there are only a few Book of Quints left, and those right now are over at the Cracked Bean Coffee Roastery in Syracuse, New York, in East Syracuse, New York. So the Cracked Bean is the official coffee of the Jaws Obsession. Michelle's Coffee is what has made uh, this possible, this entire show possible, because it keeps me awake through crazy hours in order to get this done, as well as working on the book. So that's where a few copies are left over there. And um, she does ship out, if you go to the merchandise page of her website at Crack Bean Roastery, uh, you find the link in the description of this broadcast that she will ship out. You just click on shipping instead of in-store pickup, and uh, you can order that from anywhere in the continental United States. 
So if you are interested, there's ways of doing that. If you are not in the continental United States, you might want to participate in this Book of Coin giveaway at the end of this episode because um, I will ship worldwide because I want to make sure everyone in the world gets the Book of Quint. And we'll see if we can make that happen. On to the emails. We have the first email came in from Troy. Troy wrote in, he said, I've been a Jaws fan since I was five years old. I saw it the summer it came out because my parents couldn't find a babysitter. I have pieces of memories of the movie. The music stuck with me. The shark popping out of the water in Brody's face and Hooper down in the cage are some of my earliest memories as a child. Since then, I've watched it countless times. I've introduced it to my sons and grandson. They all feel the same way. It's almost a religion around here. Every time it's shown in a theater around here, we go, even though we have an 82-inch television and a 4K copy of the movie to watch at home. Troy continues on. What you're doing is spectacular. I've always feared someone would come along and try to remake this perfect movie. With your installment, this will be squashed. I am looking forward to fleshing out what I already knew what I already thought I knew so well. The episodes where you broke the code on who blew the engine of the orca, who actually painted the billboard, and why, and what actually happened to Quint's shoulder convinced me that you were the guy for this. I am thrilled to support this, and I will, of course, issue a re review once I'm finished. I'm so looking, for looking forward to reading. Thank you so much for lighting this torch and giving us all something to look forward to. Even the folks who know nothing of this yet are sure to be blown away. I am proud and honored to be one of the first to experience this story. You have a fan for life. Again, thank you. That's Troy in South Carolina. Troy, wow, great email. Thank you so much for writing in, number one. Thank you so much for listening and realizing what we are trying to do here uh, on the Jaws Obsession is by looking at the small details, you find out that there's much bigger story there. There's, there's a larger story to be enjoyed. And um, he cited some of the episodes about uh, episode 10, who, blo who Broke the Orca. He also cited episode 30, which was uh, Billboard Vandals Caught. Uh, that's a very important episode where there's some clues in there to uh, lead us into the future. Hint, hint. He cited episode 18 about Quint's arm injury, and that was Quint's death explained. And that's one of the more famous episodes of the Jaws Obsession um, that uh, let people know that there is a lot more going on in Jaws than maybe we first realized if we look at the details. So thank you very much, Troy. And he has uh, a book on the way. I'm sure, I think, uh, I think that got delivered today. So I look forward to hearing from Troy about his first reactions to the book. And after, of course, after he reads the book. Well, one thing that Troy did say was, even the folks who know nothing of this yet are sure to be blown away. Uh, that's a very keen observation by Troy in that there's a lot of Jaws fans that are not aware of not only the Jaws obsession, but the Book of Quint as well, and what we are trying to do. Um, that was one of the things where I had to manage my time over 2022 uh, with navigating of the writing of the Book of Quint while also producing and uh, holding the broadcast of the Jaws Obsession. And then there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes, um, with, of course, with uh, gaining permission to publish from Benchley IPLLC. So the, one of the weak links that I had here was social media, where I hope that if you are listening now, if you go to those groups and sites and you make them aware of what is going on and what is happening, that the Book of Quint is real, then the word spreads. And that's how we have a, from a ground up campaign that went on with the Indiegogo campaign, but we now with the book, after we have a limited edition printing, and now going forward where I will be looking to have a wider publication to work with a publisher, that's where we have a ground up movement here. And it all starts with you, the listener. If you take that one special moment, even if you do a review of this broadcast on whatever platform you're working on, uh, listening on Spotify or Apple, we could use a lot. We could use a few more five star reviews on that Apple podcast because the Apple podcast app, if uh, with the five star reviews and if you leave some good comments, that actually makes the algorithm spread the show faster. So there are little ways that everyone can help out, and I would be very grateful if you could do that. The, the help would be much appreciated going forward because this is the blitz. Now we have the book of Quint, and now we got to throw that touchdown pass. Now we have to lob that ball over the defensive line and get that back down towards the goal. And the goal is what? The goal is to get a wide release of the publication of the book of Quint, and so everybody in the world has access to the book. That's the next step. We have to get that step if we are going to progress this any further. And that's the goal for 2023. 
Thank you, Troy. Thank you for writing in from South Carolina. Moving on to Sean. Sean writes in, Ahoy, Ryan. Finally started reading the book of Quint, and so far I'm blown away. I've been itching to start, and I knew when I did, I couldn't stop. The amount of work that you put into this is so, is just simply amazing. And so glad that all the fellow fans and I could help you make this happen. As a Navy veteran from 2002 to 2007, everything has made me smile and brought back some of the stories from some of the old salts that I met in my time in the Navy. Keep up the great work on the podcast. As long as you continue, you've got a listener, your fellow upstate New Yorker, Sean. Sean, thank you very much for writing in and uh, thank you. Uh, the Navy veterans, uh, all veterans, I've heard from Marine veterans, and I've heard from Navy veterans alike. I myself am a Coast Guard veteran, but also veterans of other military, Navy, and uh, life-saving units in other countries, that this is going. this story is going to resonate. If you have worked or you have had family that have worked on the water, this story is going to resonate with you. If you spent time in a maritime uh, environment. There's going to be uh, there's going to be an attachment to the book of Quint, and I am very thankful always to hear from the veterans. Uh, as Sean is a Navy veteran, I have there is also two local veterans. Chris and Cliff are two local Navy veterans and and local writers that live in Syracuse, New York, and they were always big supporters of the book because they would be hanging out at the Cracked Bean Roastery when I would go in there for coffee, and we and they would say, "How's the book going, Ryan?" And we would talk about it and stuff. So when they started reading, Chris actually made the comment that he believes that this book should be on every Navy ship in the fleet, and that got my the wheels turning in my mind because it's very important when you are in a, a military unit like a Navy ship that you have access to a reading material and to material that actually can entertain you. There are a lot of times that you are out at sea. Back in my time, the late 90s, early 2000s, there was, of course, there was no internet access. There weren't any phones. So what was really important was the ship's library. And on my Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, they had a small library there. And you would walk over there. If you didn't have your own book, you could go to the ship's library and you could sift through the stack of books that they had there. How great would it be to have the Book of Quint on every, not only Navy ship, but Coast Guard ship as well. Coast Guard, a small boat station and Coast Guard unit out there in the world and maybe through other countries as well. There's a lot of navies. There's the British Navy. There's the Australian Navy. So let's see if we can maybe make that happen. That got my wheels spinning, and I just recently delivered a book to a military chaplain and had a discussion with him about the possibility of getting some meetings going to make this happen. It would be a great way to see the Book of Quint go out to sea, to see this story uh, reach sailors far and wide. That would, be really, that would be a really nice way to bring it home for our favorite fisherman, our favorite nautical legend, Captain Quint. Navy veterans and all veterans seem to really be gravitating towards the Book of Quint, and they're finding that especially that first section of the book where it deals with the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, there was a lot of research that went into that. It hits close to home for many of those guys. I look forward to talking more to more veterans and to seeing where we can take this in regards to military units. Thanks, uh, Sean. Thanks, Sean, for bringing that up. And thank you for your service. I love all the emails that come in. And now there was a delay because if you remember that the first books that went out were the books that went overseas. And then we went to domestic uh, delivery. So uh, this last week, that's when the first books started landing in um, England, Finland, Australia. The books started landing around the world. And now the next two emails are very interesting. They're from England. And uh, I know all too well, all right, we're going to get to this after I read the emails, but I know all too well that the English, they take their literature very seriously. And that's not, not talking against any other country with the way the English and, and literature uh, from what I was raised on and the people I knew that were British, uh, they, re they knew books. Now, I might have known books. I know comic books, uh, <laughs> but, but they knew books and I knew that when writing the book of Quint, that this, this was going to go overseas and it was going to be in front of readers over in the United Kingdom. And that's where I said the test is going to be there. There's, there's, I mean, of course, the, there's serious readers in the United States and all countries, but I was particularly interested in how the British would take to the book of Quint. 
first email was from Jill. And Jill writes in, Hello, Ryan. I just wanted to let you know that my Book of Quint arrived safe and sound to my home in England. I saved the pleasure of opening it, opening it until Christmas morning, and I am totally blown away by the quality of the book. Having just read the prologue, this prompted me to write you to let you know that this book means the world to me, and I cannot wait to read it in its entirety. I shall savor it like a fine wine. With your permission, I will let you know my thoughts as I progress through the story. A Jaws fan since seeing it in the cinema on first release, this means so much to me. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Quint's backstory is one that needs to be told and heard. Best of luck with your endeavors, and I wish you every success. With kind regards and good wishes, Jill. Thank you so much, Jill, for that. I wrote her a long response because just by reading the prologue, she was inspired to write in and give her feelings on the book. And I understand what she is going through because that prologue, there is a lot in there. A lot of uh, conventional wisdom in modern day fiction is you do away with the prologue and epilogue that it distra- it distracts from your story and everyone puts all the work into chapter one and it's going to distract and it might leave the, in the book of Quint, the prologue and epilogue are essential to the narrative. And when you read it, you will, you will understand why those two parts of the book were the last things I wrote. I made, I made, I had the whole uh, main husk, the, the, all three parts were written. And then I went and did that. So it was, um, it was coming at a point of reflection and that's where I tried to get that across to the reader. So, uh, it inspired Jill to write in. So that let me know that, all right, we're on to something here that Jill from England is already reading the book and she already has good words from the prologue and doesn't stop there because right after Jill wrote, I had an email from Mark and Mark wrote in a full review of the book and there, there aren't any spoilers. There aren't any spoilers in these. So don't, uh, don't, don't anyone worry about the book getting ruined. If I say I'm going to read a review, I always make sure that we're going to talk about stuff that does not, um, disrupt the uh, narrative or, or, uh, or spoil the, uh, the surprise elements of the book. So here's, uh, here's Mark's review. Hi, Ryan. Literally moments ago, I finished the book of Quint. It's taken me a little over a week to read over the Christmas period, and I have to let you know my immediate thoughts. The novel is heavy in the hands and in the heart. Quint's story is one of unending struggle, and I love how you've taken those little moments in Jaws and weaved a tragic, believable, and heartbreaking story that can only serve future viewings of the movie in a positive manner. I had high expectations going in, and you have blown those out of the water like a metal canister thrown into the sea. Congratulations on crafting the perfect backstory for Quint that never misses a step and gives the events of the film greater meaning and weight. The trial and error of Quint gradually perfecting his Sharkin techniques made sense and the deal relationship with the mayor was genius. I also love the little Easter eggs of dialogue you threw in occasionally, but I must say, I don't think that's funny at all. Telling the bulk of the story from the perspective of Mr. of Mr. Salvatore also helps to make Quint an even more sympathetic and powerful character. The book ending of the tale with Hooper brought a tear to my eye. I read a lot of books every year, and this is one that will stay with me for a very long time. If Universal doesn't pick this up, then they are missing a trick. What a fantastic adventure. The book played like a movie in my mind, and I'm sure you've, you're already receiving similar messages from those of us who have backed this project. I hope the book gets a major publication and release so that a wider audience can enjoy what you've put together for fans of Jaws and good storytelling in general. I look forward to hearing your podcast to see what other backers thought. I'm certain they can't be disappointed. I'm very proud to have supported this project in a small way, and I will help spread the word regarding the Book of Quint. Thank you for a great reading experience, and have a happy and safe New Year. Best wishes, Mark in Colchester, England. Thank you, Mark, for that full review. That means so much. That means that means so much to what we have going on here. Uh, And that was a full review by Mark in Colchester, England. And then we had Jill. Remember, Jill wrote earlier. Now, these uh, Jaws has a British connection. And what is that British connection? Of course, it's Robert Shaw, arguably one of the greatest actors ever to live, cinema screen actors, to come out of Great Britain in arguably his greatest role of his life, which is in Jaws. Okay, 
So there is a, a, a British connection to Jaws. I can see that with our broadcast here of the Jaws Obsession. Uh, the UK is always consistently number two, next to the United States, number two country for most downloads. So there are a lot of British Jaws fans. And I knew that this book was going to be going over there. And one of my big, uh, I, holding it close to the vest, in the back of my mind, what I was saying was, if the reviews from the UK come back and they, the writing is, is acceptable to uh, in, in, the liter- in, in the literature standards of, from the UK, then, then the book is going to be on to new heights. It's going to be on to, great, to do great things because it's going to be constructed well. Nothing against other countries. Remember, this is not a dig on other countries. It's just that there are, there are a lot of history in authors that come from the UK. There also is in the United States. My, one of my personal favorites is Ernest Hemingway. So what we have here is we have a book that is now aimed at just how Jaws is, is that it's looking to be accepted by multiple countries as Jaws was as well. And these two, e- these emails, all the emails, uh, but uh, also as I start getting reviews from England, are letting me know that we are onto something here. There's something special being brought into the world. I thank you very much, Mark, for that review. Well, great emails this week. Great, great emails. And I'm sorry if I did not get to any other ones. It's just that we do not have much time. Uh, we still want to make these shows somewhat manageable uh, for time. So we have to move on. So what I wanted to do now was transition over to this appearance that I had uh, the day after Christmas that I appeared on the show Positive Blatherings, the podcast, which is also on video. It was my first time doing a video interview. Nothing on the Jaws Obsession is live. So I have a chance to edit out maybe some missteps or I have a chance to do over some lines if I if they might not uh, come out the right way. So there is an added pressure when you go into a live setting and you, and you hit the video and the video is turned on. So this was my first experience in 16 years when talking about a project to go on and to be interviewed, not knowing what those questions are going to be. But what happened was is Scott, Scott Fitzgerald, if everyone can remember, in episode 36, he came on the Jaws Obsession and he talked about his work in doing the audiobook version of chapter 16 and 17 to the book of Quint for episode 37. So now it was my turn to go into his domain and into his studio over at Rockbox Recording in Rochester, New York. And I'll tell you what happened was something I never expected. He allowed me his questions. He was such a good host that it allowed me to open up to areas and talk about elements of not just Jaws, but the, uh, the mindset behind this broadcast and the writing of the Book of Quint and talk about it in ways that I don't get a chance to on the Jaws Obsession. So I'm going to play a little segment from that that I took out, and uh, let's see what you think. So here it is. This is from the uh, Positive Blatherings episode 109 that aired on Friday, December 30th on over on YouTube. So here it is. But there's this tightrope. Everything is a tightrope in, in the world, and you have to walk that. That's like the novel. It was Everything was a tightrope, and it's like if too heavy on this side, I'm not going to get permission from the bench. It's too heavy on this side, and it's just I'm going to lose the, the listener or the reader. Or the, and it's just so when you, when you do stuff with these projects, and that's the way I saw it with this novel, I turned to my wife first thing. I said, I, I got to write this book. And she said, well, you're going to have to, you know, if, if you feel, feel strong enough to do it, you're going to have to do it. And I, but I knew the weight of what I w- had to do. It was in there. I didn't really have it lined out yet, but I knew that this was going to consume my life and it was going to be painful. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do it. That was, <laughs> that was the thing. I didn't want to do it. I really didn't. There was many nights before I even started. I said, I, what are you doing, Ryan? Stop. Stop. And then just go watch Bering Sea Gold. Go watch, your, you know, go watch uh, Curse of Oak Island and then go back to work and just get, you know, that's, and then I said, no, no, this has to be done because my, f- another fear is fear of regret. I didn't want to be lying in bed, like brilliant Braveheart line. You're lying in bed 50 years from now, all these years from now, and you're asking yourself, what could you have, what would you have done? Would you have rather have done this? Yes. I did not want to be. 50 years from now saying, I should have done this. And that was my biggest thing. 2025 is coming up. And I knew with the way corporate Hollywood works and and I show, hopefully I'm not burning any bridges, but I didn't want to see them screw up the Jaws franchise any more than they already did. (laughs) 
<laughs> so that was part of it. It was well, all there. It was just protection. It was protecting our favorite movie. That's what this book is. It's, it's protection. I love that. I, that that's, that's perfect. And that was from my appearance over on uh, the Positive Blatherings podcast. You can follow the link. There's a link right down in the description of this broadcast. And you can go right over. It will take you right over to YouTube so you can watch that full interview. That full interview is 90 minutes long. I think it might be over 90 minutes, but that that is probably if you uh, that it might as well be another episode of the Jaws Obsession because we it, it gets very detailed into what we do here. We don't we might not talk about Jaws per se, but if you want to know more about the Book of Quint and what is it like going forward into 2023, please go over and watch what Scott Fitzgerald put together. I owe him a big thanks for the opportunity, and I look forward to go back on his show uh, once he finishes the Book of Quint, and then we can do what we're going to do another one there. So, I had a great time. I hope everyone can learn a little bit more about the motivations behind the Book of Quint, but also the plans going forward. Please follow the links to Positive Blatherings podcast in the description of this broadcast that you're listening to right now on whatever platform you are listening on. Moving on to one email, and that's going to kick us over to what we're going to talk about here in the JAWS subtext. This is from CJ, who was a backer on the Book of Quint campaign for Indiegogo. And he wrote in to tell me, he says, I got it. As in he got, he received the Book of Quint. It's freaking sweet. He says, I am waiting for the hustle and bustle to die down before diving in. But if the story is as good as the presentation, it's going to, it's going to be awesome. By the way, kudos on using pages from the book as packing paper. That was cool. I had extra when, when I was writing the book of Quint, I, um, when you're editing, I had, uh, copies of the book printed out on regular paper. So I could make edits and you, you read, uh, when you're reading a physical copy of the book, some uh, other things stand out. So what I had was an extra one of those and it was, uh, so I needed packing in order to center the book. So it didn't roll around in the cardboard mailer. So I used pages from the book of Quint, uh, one of the earlier drafts and, uh, to send them out to the backers as packing paper. That was just one of those things. Those were one of those pleasant little happy accidents. Isn't that what Jaws was? Was just, just one gigantic happy accident. So uh, we're full of those over here at the Jaws obsession. So he continues on. He says, I was born in 1975. Jaws and Star Wars has, have always run a really close race in my mind as my favorite movies. About five years ago, after some critical thinking, Jaws leaped forward as my favorite. While I've been a lifelong Star Wars fanboy, I find myself sometimes burned out on the film. Jaws, on the other hand, I could watch any time and every time. I don't get tired of it. It's not like other movies. And you've proven that on the Jaws obsession. I've always known and felt that it was different, even from Spielberg's other films. Although you've pointed out numerous r ways that the film is different and special, and I wholeheartedly agree, there is something intangibly different about it. The best way to explain it is that the movie is shot from the outside. Most movies hone in on things or zoom in on things. They explain things and let you know what's going on. Jaws doesn't do that. It stands back and makes you feel like there's a lot more going on than what you know about, but it doesn't tell you that. Your show has proven that there was more going on than we knew. When I watch it, I don't feel like I am a part of the action. I feel as though I'm looking at a world through a picture tube, and the world is so real that the characters don't know that they are in a movie. Anyway, like I said, I can't explain it. Thanks again for the hard work. I can tell by your show and book that you are an attention-to-details to kind of person, and I'm sure that I will love the story. That's CJ in Ida, Michigan. Thank you so much for writing in, CJ. I'm glad you got your book. And your last paragraph there where you said that it, it, there's the, that Jaws makes you feel like there's a lot more going on than what you know about, but it doesn't tell you that. Yeah, let's see if we can explain that for because uh, that, that email is a perfect segue into what we are doing here on episode 51. We're gonna, we are going to talk about Jaws subtext. That is the term now. What we're going to look at is what is subtext? And this is where Jaws excels in many ways when I talk about uh, the Jaws is a human movie with a monster shark in it. It's not a monster shark movie. If you look at all the other action movies that have come out in the 70s, or if you look at all the other action movies that have been out since, 
even if you look at the modern day shark movies that are coming out, they lack subtext and they lack it for, um, uh, for creative reasons. First, we're going to, we're going to define subtext and then we're going to get into on why Jaws does it so well. So there is a channel on YouTube that I follow very closely. It's called Film Courage. And I'm going to provide a link in the description of this broadcast. But also, if you go to our Telegram server over at Jaws OB over at Telegram, this will be in the show notes as well. And you're going to be able to watch this video and, and these articles that I'm going to reference. You're going to, I'll post them over there. On the channel Film Courage, there was a small segmented video by Judith Weston, an interview with Judith Weston, who has been a teacher of directors, actors, and writers since 1985. She, she has written two books, Directing Actors and the Film Director's Intuition. If you go watch the video that we're going to play a clip from, you're going to see her credentials and a whole, and a whole list of other material by Miss Weston. But here, let's play Miss Weston talking about what subtext is. Here we go. Here's a great way to explain subtext. Let's say that you uh, have renovated your house, renovated your living room and put a lot of time and energy and money into it. And then a friend comes to the door for the first time, and they come in and they say, oh, you changed everything around. <laughs> right? What's the subtext, right? It's like they don't like it. That's the subtext, right? And, but if they come in and they say, oh, you changed everything around, and you know that they did like it. So that's, we, subtext happens in our daily lives all the time. It's, you know, it, it affects the way that the line comes out. It's, it's the emotional, Sanford Meisner used to talk about there's an, the, the emotions of the scene are a river, the words are boats that float on that river. So the subtext is the emotional river of the scene or, or the, of the character. So that was Judith Weston and discussing exactly the, in a very practical way, what subtext is. And now or I'm going to go switch over to an article that's over on the rightpractice.com. This is an article titled Subtext Examples, Seven Simple Techniques to Super Supercharge Your Scenes by Jocelyn Chase. Let's get, into the, uh, let's get into the definition of subtext. So Jocelyn Chase writes that subtext is the unspoken, less obvious, and sometimes hidden meaning beneath the words and actions in a scene. It becomes understood as the scene and story progress, revealed to the reader through subtle clues. Subtext occurs when the words don't match the actions, and we all know what that means. Actions speak louder than words. I'm going to skim through this article and read some parts that stand out, and then we're going to see if we can apply those to Jaws. And I will give three examples from Jaws in, in how subtext plays out, and it's one of the reasons why Jaws is such a success. So Jocelyn Chase writes in this article, she says, when you think about the books and stories that you most enjoyed reading, chances are that story's scenes were woven with something deeper than what appeared on the surface. Like a puzzle, subtext puts the reader's brain to work, piecing together clues to arrive at the emotional truth of a scene. Emotional truth, just what uh, Judith Weston was talking about. It makes the story more engaging and more memorable for the reader because the truth of a scene lies not in the words, but in the crux between the word and action. Sometimes direct dialogue serves your purpose best, but there are situations where your writing will take on a greater impact if you keep it a little off the nose when writing dialogue. In fact, that's how real dialogue in real life often works. This can be difficult because it means trusting your reader to pick up on significant subtextual cues, but it's an important step. One of the theories that I invested fully in when writing the book of Quint was that the reader is smart. Today's readers, they do not need everything handed to them on a silver platter. In fact, it's nice to, when the reader has to work for a little bit of information. I just think that's really interesting because that's exactly my approach with the book of Quint is the same way that she's describing here in this article about how it's an important step keeping uh, that trusting your reader to pick up on those uh, subtextual cues that you, you can trust the reader. And, and as a filmmaker, you can trust the viewer. The viewer is smart too. And that's what Steven Spielberg did back in 1974 when he was filming Jaws. She goes on to say, filmmakers are fabulous at capturing meaningful subtext in their scenes. 
capitalizing on effective screenwriting to pull viewers beneath the surface where they can appreciate a, a deeper significance. You can use your character's body language to express meaning beyond the spoken word. And that is that right there. This is where Steven Spielberg had excelled and made Jaws into a movie unlike anything we ever saw. And still, it's hard to find. That's why I think it's the greatest movie of all time. Is on the surface, uh, Steven Spielberg was directing a movie with a shark, but underneath is a woven mat of human physical and emotional interactions. And it's why we continue to watch it over and over again. It's one of those reasons why it holds up over time and it spans generations because there is this, a, a lot of subtextual significance going on underneath this story that could have easily just been Monster Shark Attacks Island, which is kind of what the sequels devolved into. So that's where we're looking at what is Jaws subtext. Well, Jaws subtext is pretty much what makes the movie. And I understood this going into the book of Quint, that if there was going to be a prequel, it would have to be as subtextually significant as Jaws was as well. One other thing that I thought was really interesting that, uh, that Jocelyn Chase writes in her article was she, she talks about the Hemingway's iceberg theory. Uh, she says, Ernest Hemingway was, a, was brilliant at using subtext, especially in his short stories. Working as a journalist during his early years, he developed the habit of using brevity on the surface and letting the depth of meaning shine through from beneath. His story, Hills Like White Elephants, is the quintessential example of how to use subtext in dialogue to convey the meaning of something important without ever stating it explicitly. Reading his short stories is like a masterclass in subtextual technique. To get a better idea of what subtext is and how it can enhance your fiction, try reading some Hemingway stories and start with Hills Like White Elephants. And I absolutely agree with Jocelyn Chase here on her article, Subtext, Exa uh, subtext Examples, on the rightpractice.com. And if you go to our show notes, you can see, I'm going to put a link to the full article and read that full article. Hemingway was way ahead of his time in that he had this iceberg theory where he felt less is more, that the reader should only know the tip of the iceberg, that 20% of the story, and there should be a, an 80% that they can't see in the text. It should be sensed in that 20% and seen above the water, but there's so much more going on behind what they see. So he had that iceberg theory. I hope I did it justice there. I'm not a Hemingway scholar, but that theory is what makes Jaws so amazing is because there's more going on. Even though we're seeing, we are seeing stuff, we are, we are watching people interact in Jaws, there is more going on beneath and behind. And that's, and that's what the Jaws obsession has done is it's poked, it, it has pointed out those subtextual significant scenes. And that's where um, I was always using earlier in uh, the whole last year, I was using the term layering and layering and, and uh, all these layers. Well, that's what it is. The layering is the subtext, is that you're layering on multiple, you have other areas of thought and things that went on, and that creates the subtext of what makes the scene so special. So something simple like a man sitting at a dinner table with his son becomes a very heavy, powerful scene if you know what happened before, okay? And that's why Jaws is the special movie that it is. So let's move on into the movie Jaws, and I'm going to give you three examples. We're going to focus on Martin Brody, and we're going to focus on three different examples of why Martin Brody, uh, where, where subtext is used, and it makes what's going on in the scene more powerful and deeper if you look at the details. So let's go over to the movie here. Let's switch over to the movie. So the first one is it comes up at uh, eight minutes and 58 seconds into the movie. So let's play that. Well, you're up awful early. Is the chief in there? Well, chief, what have you got on? Holly, if this new filing system is going to work, you've got to keep that outdated stuff off my desk. Just the pending, all right? Yes, chief. Now, we got a bunch of calls about that karate school. It seems that the nine-year-olds from the school have been karate in the picket fences. Karate in the picket fences. I love how she does that. So um, does anyone else wave their hand like she does? I do that every time I see it. It's great. So uh, in this scene, all right, we have uh, Cassidy. 
is sitting in the uh, facing the camera when uh, when we when, and Hendrix is in the back with his back against the wall. If you see both of their glasses, they have Alka Seltzer uh, clouded glasses. So the, obviously, we just came from the body recovery of Chrissy Watkins, which was a gruesome scene. They are distraught. Probably both of them never seen a dead body before, especially Cassidy, who as who was with her with was with Chrissy the night before. So uh, they both have upset stomachs and they are sipping on uh, a glass of Alka Seltzer water. Okay, Alka Seltzer being um, <clears throat> uh, back in the seventies was the the, uh, the the tablets that you put in that fizz that would calm your stomach acids down. As it zooms into Brody's office and he's typing. His out his police report. We see the full glass of water with the with that's already fizzed up, but it's sitting on his desk untouched. So what does that tell us? This adds. This is the subtext of the situation: is that there aren't aren't any words have to be no words have to be spoken here. You don't have to have Chief Brody saying some hammy line like, "Oh, you guys have upset stomach." I've seen this many times in uh, New York City. You know, as in a weaker screenplay or a weaker director would have included that. Instead, Steven Spielberg just stages his actors with two guys drinking the alka seltzer and one guy completely ignoring his glass. So that tells me that Chief Brody has some experiences with not only the recovery of dead bodies, but also with police crime scenes and murder investigations. He goes right into business mode. And if you want to know exactly what he's doing on this episode, you go to episode 16, the Jaws timeline explained, and uh, we, we go right into what he's uh, doing on that typewriter with the, uh, with, with the paperwork. That's a little bit of an example of subtext of how Spielberg uses subtext to show the uh, to show the history of a character without actually having to say it. So let's move on through the movie. We're going to go to. Oh, hi, Ellen Brody. Your husband's home. Yes. I'd really uh, like to talk to him. Uh, yes, so would I. Uh, so we're going to go to the dinner scene here that we all know can I get so you well. Some coffee? Would you no, like no, something no, no, to no, drink? Thank you, thank you. Oh, wine. How nice. How was your day? Well, yeah. I got uh, red and white. I didn't know what you'd be serving. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Is anyone eating this? So there we have, not only that, we have subtext. How was your day? Swell. It wasn't swell. The words don't match up what really happened, but because we know, because we have context, because we know what happened, and we saw this, the, the, the interaction with Mrs. Kittner, that the subtext, what, how, the, how he says swell, it takes on a whole new meaning. And that's what Jaws does so perfectly. We also have Matt Hooper comes in and sits down. We know that before he asked the fisherman, do you know, does anyone know where there's a hotel or a place to eat on the island? And the guy says, just walk straight ahead. So, uh, so he has... He's looking for some place to have dinner, and he can't find it. So when he comes in and he's hungry, and he says, "Has anybody uh, is anybody eating this?" and he pulls the thing. So we know that Matt Hooper is still an outsider. He is not used to this island. So just by a simple that simple one simple line before with his interaction with the other fishermen, and then here where he's hungry. And he does something, which is that he takes Martin's plate and just pulls it over there while asking permission. And he starts eating. That is subtextual. And that's what Spielberg does so well here. That's what, and I don't think that's, this was not us. This was not a screenplay idea. It was just that Spielberg was in the zone where he was going, no, I can, I can make this into a scene and add weight to it by having details that were planted before earlier. So now we know that Matt Hooper is still an outsider. He still hasn't found a place to eat. He's hungry and he has uh, now found something to eat. So there's a subtext in that as well. And furthermore, you can actually see that with Brody not eating, with Martin Brody not touching his dinner plate, he is now doing the, he is now on the full sympathetic response. If you, the, his sympathetic nervous system has still taken over from the stress of the day. He has not calmed down. If you listen to episode 49, the I Got No Spit episode, where we analyzed why does Hooper have no spit 
uh, at the end of Jaws. It's his sympathetic nervous system is taking down and he's stressed out in a stressed out situation. And that what happens with physiologically that shuts down his salivary glands. And that is what's happened to Martin Brody. So now we know by him having a full plate of food in front of him, we already know that he's still stressed and he's still thinking about what happened. It's not even spoken about. All it is is, how was your day? Swell, but he's got a full plate of food. Matt Hooper says, is anybody eating this? We know so much that's going on already without having to be told. And that's what Jaws does. It treats you like you are a smart person. It doesn't talk down to you. And that's what is so amazing about this movie. That's why it's the greatest movie of all time. Let's move on. We have one more, and this is going to be one of my favorite, this is probably my most favorite moment of subtext, one of my most favorite moments of subtext, and it's why I chose the image on the title card as you saw it when you selected to listen to this episode. We're going to go to Martin and Ellen's embrace before him getting on the orca at the end of the movie. Colorful, isn't it? Don't use the fireplace in the den because I haven't what fixed am I the food yet. Tell him I'm going fishing. Bring it up with you, Chief! Daylight's wasted! Front bow! Back stern! Okay, everybody, when you go watch Jaws again, I want you to watch this scene again. This scene takes place, it's right there at 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 29 seconds into the movie. You have Martin and Ellen share an embrace before he goes on. And Quint says, break it up. Will you achieve daylight's wasted? You have Ellen go to pull away from the embrace because she knows she's a police officer's wife. She's got to be tough in this situation. And she doesn't want to embarrass him in front of the other men. And so she goes to pull away. And what does Martin Brody do? He pulls her back in to continue the embrace. And that is such a powerful moment. I've always loved this scene. It's before boarding the Orca that, that um, Martin is going to do things on his terms. It's a new Martin from the start of the movie. He's not going to get pushed around anymore. So what he does is he pulls Ellen back in and holds her that for the small beat right there, because Ellen is hearing Quint and Martin says, no, I will finish hugging my wife goodbye on my terms. I'm not going to let her pull away because Quint yelled. That is subtext right there. It is the definition of subtext. You could teach a film school of it. You could teach a director's course, a screenwriter's course. In this one scene, just by having that motion without any dialogue being said, it's just in a hug, but it's the way they separate from the hug. Ellen goes to pull away first. Martin pulls her back in, and then he lets her go and turns towards Quint on his terms, not on Quint's. Amazing, amazing moment in Jaws. I've always loved this part, and I'm so glad that I got to be able to isolate this as part of the Jaws subtext. Now that we know that, everybody, you can go watch Jaws again, and you can look at... There's, I bet you I could find about 50 examples of subtext in Jaws. We could do this all day long. We can do we can do 10 episodes of Jaws subtext. It's amazing. And this was Spielberg. Remember, this was Steven Spielberg. Spielberg was directing his actors. Spielberg was blocking these scenes. Spielberg knew that uh, this is what a young Steven Spielberg did, and he did it so well. Everybody talks about the yellow barrels in, in place of the shark and all those little elements that we know already. But what he did was this subtextual significance of many of these scenes. And that's why we keep coming back. That's why CJ wrote the email. And he said, there's something about Jaws that Star Wars doesn't have. I, I That's why I keep revisiting it. I always watch it. It's why we always watch it, because there's something there. Because every time you watch the movie, if you look for certain subtextual elements, you will see, you will notice new things. And that's what we are doing. Now, the next episode, we're going to get into Jaws context. Because in order to have subtext, you have to have context. And that's going to be in episode 52. But I don't want to get into that right now. We're going to get into that in the next episode. <laughs> episode. And, but, but that's what's amazing about this, is that, that we're here. And that's where one of the many things I did with the writing of the Book of Quint was to add 
uh, subtext to write with that knowledge that the reader is smart, that these are Jaws, that you are, that I was writing to Jaws fans and that Jaws fans are going to be re- reading this. So I knew that those subtextual elements had to be there in, in, in how the story is portrayed. I, it, you just don't come out and say stuff. You have to cr- think of creative ways in order to get that story out so that because everyone that's watched Jaws is used to this. And that's why we see modern day movies and they don't have what Jaws has because this is a art unto itself. And frankly, many directors do not know how to stage or to portray that. They, 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 they will go to heavy handed techniques to just get the movie done or maybe they're not as hands-on and it's their director of photography that's doing the scenes. So we have to really appreciate what Steven Spielberg did for this movie Jaws. So with that, now let's move on to the exciting Book of Quint giveaway. I have three Books of Quint that I will send out in packages and I will send out to anyone in the world. I will ship around the world. I don't care if you are the, the few listeners that we have in Japan, a book of Quentin will go out to you. That's how, that's how, that's how serious I am. We are going to have fun in 2023. We actually have to celebrate this. We have a new novel. That's an authorized derivative work of Jaws and Peter Benchley's characters by Benchley IP LLC. This is as exciting as it gets. And we have to relish in that, that there is a new novel that is in the world that readers are enjoying it. And they are excited that the story is broadening, that Jaws as we know it is, the scope is opening up. So in order to drum up that excitement, we're going to have a contest. And it's a very simple contest. My email here is jawsob2025 at gmail.com. Over, let's see, what is the date today? The date today is January 3rd. So this broadcast will air on the 4th of January. It will broadcast across all pl- podcasting platforms around the world, as well as the sa- at the same time, I'm going to put it on YouTube. So everybody gets a fair shot. If you can email me in here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com, the actual brand of scuba tank that Hooper uses in the movie Jaws, I will take your email. You have, you have to include your email, just your email, and then I will take that email, your address, and your answer, if it's the correct one, and I'm going to throw that into a hat. Then I'm going to have one of my daughters do a drawing. So we're going to hold the drawing. Yeah, we'll hold the drawing on Monday, January 9th, 2023. So that's going to give everybody... One, two, three, four, five, six. That's going to give everybody six days to get your answer in, to listen to this broadcast. If you can email me at jawsob2025 at gmail.com, if you can email me the what company made the scuba tank that Hooper uses in Jaws, that's going to go into the hat. We're going to have a drawing, and then three of those drawings, uh, three of those names will be picked out. I'll email you back and let you know you're the winner. Then you just send me your mailing address, and I will mail out a book of Quint to you, free of charge. That's how exciting this is, because my goal in 2023 is to get everyone to read the book of Quint, to get everyone to have access to the book of Quint. And if, if what little part I can do from this sitting in here in the Jaws Obsession Bunker is to get these books sent out to people. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to, we only have, uh, we we only have so many left. We did not print that many. And that's the whole thing to make this fair. uh, Remember there are some available over at crack bean coffee roastery. If you go to their website, follow the link in the description below. It's the official coffee of the jaws obsession. If you grab a bag of coffee would be most appreciated because that's the coffee that fueled the book. So if you can do that, that would be great. But this is also an opportunity to possibly win one. So email me back at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. And there you have it. The book of Quint, the drawing. And also, also, if you have, let's ever get, let's give other people a chance. If you were a backer to the book of Quint campaign, people that did not get a book already, let's give them a chance to get the book as well. So I'm sorry if you were a former backer, you're, I'm going to have to politely say that you're that, <laughs> that you're ineligible, just like my family and friends are ineligible of this as well. So exciting times are ahead. 2023, happy new year to everybody, and we're on to an exciting year. We're going to get these books out into your hands, and everybody is going to enjoy the Book of Quint. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. And 
that's episode 51, Jaws Subtext. Thank you very much for listening this week. Remember, we could really use some likes, comments, shares, five-star ratings on whatever podcast platform you're listening on, or if you're over at YouTube listening, make sure you hit that thumbs up and subscribe. Also, we are now over at Instagram, at Book of Quint, over at Instagram.com. Make sure you follow us over there. That's going to be the de facto Jaws Obsession port for and the Book of Quint for all the latest developments that are coming in. So if everyone goes and follows over there, and we'll try to keep you up to speed. Also on JawsOB.com, the notes section, I'll be putting up the latest and greatest with what's happening with the Book of Quint over there. So, the movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act. All rights reserved to the copyright owners. So now we know about Jaws subtext. Next episode, we're going to listen and we're going to learn about Jaws context. And how does that work into what we have going on here? So thank you very much for listening this week, folks. As always, it's been a pleasure. Until next week, farewell and adieu. Show me the way to go home.